Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Hope City Church. I'm Trish Davis alongside my beautiful husband, Justin. Yo, yo. And we are excited. It's kind of a little bit different today. Thought we would give a little bit living room feel as you've been inviting us to your living rooms for months and months. We wanted to welcome you into ours. And so thanks for, thanks for being here. I'm super excited about today. And we just really wanted uh, this to feel like a conversation that I think everybody is pretty much desperate for. And so I, if, whether you're listening online or you're here in person, I truly believe that God is up to some really good things today. So thank you for for being here. We are excited to continue this series, Aftermath, and I wanted to have the love seat up here, one, to go beyond social distancing, but, uh, since that's my wife, uh, but Trish said I would actually like be laying down by the end of the service if we had the love seat, so we're in two separate chairs. We are socially distanced, even though we're going to go to the same house after this service, but we want to just, you know, optics for COVID, and, um, and so we're excited to be here. Um, if you are a guest with us today, I want to say a special welcome to you. I love the vibe and the feel of this week's service, and we'd love to get to know you either online or in person. If you're here in person and are here for the first time, stop by Guest Central. And if you're watching online for the first time, let them know in the chat uh, so that we can follow up with you. This was just an excuse for me to bring my coffee up, up on stage, which is really fun. But I know some of you people, you've already gotten your Christmas shopping done. But when this happens, when Starbucks starts producing these Christmas cups, I feel stress. Anybody else? Like, let us know in the chat if you're like, yay, no, too soon. Um, so I guess I no think they released it. I think they released it soon to give people, like, good vibes, not oh. stress. Okay, now I feel really That's bad. That's just because of us because we haven't started Good Christmas shopping. everybody. Yeah, so, absolutely. So where are we We have a rule. Today? We don't go Christmas shopping until after Thanksgiving. It's just a family rule. I can't break it. I've seen people put up Christmas trees already before Halloween. I was like, it's 2020. You can do whatever you want. That's right. All right. Well, hey, we're in second week of this Aftermath series. And I, as if you weren't here last week, I mentioned last week that we started this series um, last Sunday. I really wanted to do it in August. And we realized in August, wow, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. And so let's not do a series about the aftermath of a pandemic until we're through it. So let's do it in November. <laughs> oh, that's funny. We had 5,000 cases yesterday in the state of Indiana. And so we're still in the midst of a pandemic. But I think the aftermath of the pandemic is still having effects on our mental health, our emotional health, our relational health, uh, which we're going to get into in just a second. And, and so last week we talked about emotional health and we talked about how to deal with our anger. This week we're going to talk about how to have healthy conversations. And if you weren't here last week, the definition of aftermath is the consequences or the after effects of a significant, unpleasant event. And I think it's safe to say that we have had some significant, unpleasant events over the last eight months. And we want to talk today openly and honestly. Uh, Trish and I travel and speak quite a bit. We talk about marriage. In fact, we're doing a marriage conference just outside of Pittsburgh. We're going to ground zero of the 2020 election uh, next week. And, um, but we tell a 15-year-old story in our marriage conference. Uh, we're going to tell you some five-day-old stories uh, today. And we're going to tell you some two-month-old stories today. Maybe um, two-minute stories. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's some aftermath going on up here uh, in our relationship. Um, but we really hope that this conversation is centered around a specific verse uh, in the Bible um, no matter what relational status you have, this is hopefully is going to apply to your friendships. Uh, if your parents, it's going to apply to your parenting relationships. Uh, if you are married, it's going to apply hopefully to your marriage and to your dating relationships. We really want this to, to be very, very practical and very, very specific to our relational world. So um, over the last you know, few months, we've had um, just really a lot of um, things that have been turned upside down. And I put in your notes, if you, uh, if you have the app open, that there has been some aftermath to COVID-19 in our relationships. And the first aftermath is this, that our routines have been disrupted. The routine of our life has been disrupted for the last eight months. And um, this last Friday, um, our 17-year-old son texted us and he said, hey, he said, I'm, I, I don't know what's going on at my school, but the nurse keeps on going into different classrooms and kids keep leaving. And come to find out, uh, there are 25 students from his school that have been quarantined for the next 14, uh, 14 days. And thankfully, he had no contact with them, so he's still in school. Uh, but the, we, our other kids, our younger kids, started school on e-learning. Uh, Trish and I spent the first um, four months of 
of COVID uh, doing, or first two months of COVID doing e-learning at home. And what we realized is, one, we really appreciate teachers, and two, we're, we're, we got, found our calling that we're glad we're not teachers, all right? <laughs> There's no way we could have been teachers. And our, the, the routine of our life has been disrupted. And if you are a person of routine, and even if you say I'm not a person of routine, you have routines. And when that routine of your life has been disrupted, it begins to have an effect on your relational world. It has an effect on your relationship with God, and it begins to have an effect on the people that are closest to you. Another after effect is that our capacity has been stretched. Our mental capacity, our emotional capacity, um, our relational capacity has been stretched beyond its limits. Uh, We are two working parents that have three kids in two different schools. Uh, We have two adult children. One's in college, one is married. And we completely lost 17 marriage conferences that we were going to be doing in 2020 and 2021. Um, The way that we did church was completely turned upside down. And we have felt max to our capacity in patience, in grace, in love, in um, energy. And one of the things that I think is hard is when you feel like you're max to your capacity in your relational world, what begins to happen is the people closest to you begin to suffer because we don't want to admit that we're maxed out, and so we pretend like we aren't, and then those around us actually get the brunt of us feeling to our capacity. And so we want to talk about what that looks like uh, today. So true story, sometimes it's beyond your household, but in the first two months of e-learning, we were all kind of just figuring out, maybe you have two, and um, I was having conversations, intense discussions with one of my children who I did not realize was live on their class. And I think I was pretty much half-dressed. I looked very scary, Mommy, at the moment. Uh, And I was scary, Mommy. And when I realized that I was not just talking to one of my kids, but the entire class, including the teacher, um, in my wisdom and um, in my adultness, I just took the computer and slammed it shut. So, I mean... It was awesome because I typically do stuff like that. Yeah. Like when we have a Zoom call, like Trisha like sets this, the furniture behind the Zoom to make it look like the house is cleaner than it really is, right? <laughs> there, she does all the lighting just perfectly. She brings lights into other rooms. And so for her to like lose it on the Zoom in front of the whole class, I was like, better her than me. That's all I thought. We um, did do one conference online. This is so not in my notes. And I did just what Justin said. Felt really good. It was a good shot. And then we get through with doing this on-air, like, live Zoom conference. And I go to the bathroom, and I realize that I'd put my makeup on, but I didn't quite rub it in. So I had, like, this dot on my forehead the whole time. So, But, but here's the deal. Like, of all of these things, kind of the last point in, in the whole thing of COVID is we're all processing the stress in this crisis all together at the same time. But the truth of it is that our processing is different from one another. And so we're feeling the intenseness of everybody's feelings and emotions. And the, the scripture that has come to our mind over and over again is this passage in Galatians, and you may be familiar with it. Um, it it's called the fruit of the Spirit, and it's Galatians uh, 5, chapter 5, verses 22, 23. And I do have my Bible, but I don't have this version in my Bible, and it says this. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And so this is where we're going to camp out today. And what we just want to have a discussion is this, how do we have healthy relationships in the midst of every, everything being disrupted, in the midst of feeling like you are maxed out, stretched out, uh, when you're feeling like everybody is going through the same thing and yet you're processing it different than your spouse, your best friend, your roommate, um, your adult kids, your little, little kids. What do you do? And so we just have kind of a, a list of best practices that we are still living out. We're going to tell some stories on ourselves today of how do you do this. And the first thing that we would encourage you is to believe the best and then be proven wrong. One of the things that we did a few months ago is we did a study on this passage, Trish and I did, Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that I realized is that our marriage would be so much better if she just lived this out. And so um, I'm going to let her talk about how to believe the best. This I'm is just... what happens when we give him a mic. Um... I was so proud of that joke. I told her that joke and right, you know, backstage right before we came That's out here. That's a great dad joke. We'll, we'll just, yeah. we'll just and, go And uh, she's it. like, she didn't laugh and neither did you, so we'll move on. <laughs> you know... Don't use second service. <laughs> If you follow me on social media, you know the 20, past 24 hours have been a firestorm uh, for me when I had uh, mentioned um, that our elected president and vice president, and uh, we said last week that we are an apolitical church. We love that people that come here are diehard Trump fans, supporters. Um, we love that we have diehard um, Biden you know, supporters, that our belief is that we are anchored in Jesus and there is room for people to have their beliefs and we're not always going to agree. Sometimes we have to agree to disagree. And it does not matter so much what I posted, the shocking, which I don't know why I'm shocked, um, was a very specific group of women um, came after me. I mean, came after me with some really vile, vile words um, in my DMs. And it came back to this best practice to think the best, right? Think the best and be proven wrong. And we look at this scripture of the fruits of the spirit. And I, I had another friend of mine who had posted another post that wasn't about politics, but it was about an anchor who had a very emotional response to the election. And she too um, just got annihilated so she put on her uh, Instagram video something that just stuck with me. And she said this, friends, I appreciate your words, but I want to encourage you to check your fruit. I was like, ah! you know, check your fruit. And what she's saying, and as we disagree with one another, listen, this isn't just about an election. We are stretched we are stressed out. We are all doing it in real time. And so the best practice is think the best. And so although my heart was really, um, I, I mean, I went to bed tired last night. But I just felt like God just kept coming back to our message. What is the fruit? Kindness, gentleness, self-control. And then I began to read a couple of verses before the fruits of the Spirit are given. And listen to what it says in Galatians chapter 5, um, starting with verse 16. So it says, So I advise you to live according to your new life in the Holy Spirit. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is just the opposite with the Holy Spirit. Then it says this, and the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite from our sinful nature desires. And this is what got me. It says, and these two forces are constantly fighting each other. They're constantly fighting each other. And your choices are never free from this conflict. And I think the human condition, when we are maxed out, we are stressed out, and we feel like the world is against us, is to think the worst rather than think the best. And I often don't dialogue with people who send mean things, but I felt like God said, you need to respond. And I did in love and just said, thank you for your words. Thank you for your opinion. And then I got a DM this morning from one of the people that were probably most vile to me, and she said, I'm really sorry. She said, I'm so tired, and I'm so stressed out, and I took it out on you. Check your fruit. And what happens is when we think the best, it's not something that we put on our table to say, think the best one another, or we hang it up this saying in our homes, what the Bible is reminding us is, listen, we are always going to be in conflict with ourselves, our sinful nature selves. So lean in to the fruit, a fruit that tells us to be kind, 
to have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. One of the things that we've seen over and over again in our marriage, we've seen this in our relationship with our kids, that trust is the basis of all relationships. And in order to have trust in a relationship, you have to believe the best. You have to assume the best. So when you assume the best of a person that you're in a relationship with and you're proven wrong, then what you do is you change the perspective and you change the, um, the way that you filter information in that relationship. If that person is critical, if that person says something that uh, you don't agree with, one of the things that I have, have to believe about Trish is that she is for me. Yeah. Right? I have to believe that about my kids. My kids are for me. My kids need to believe that I am for them. And so if I correct them, it's not because I don't like them. I'm correcting them because I am for you. If I have a tough conversation with a friend, I am for this friendship. Right? And so when you believe the best, it changes the temperature of that relationship and it changes the starting place that you have in that relationship. Yeah. The second principle to having Healthy relationships in the midst of, pan- of a pandemic is pray for your most difficult relationship. Pray for the person that is your most difficult relationship. Is that an ex-spouse? Is that an ex-boss? Is, is that a coworker? Is that your current spouse? Is that a child? Is that a parent? Like who is your a mother-in-law? It, who is your most difficult relationship? And here's why this is important. It is very difficult to be angry and to hold a grudge against someone that you're praying for. Like when you pray for someone, what you are doing is you are submitting that relationship to God. And I have people tell me all the time, well, if I pray for my husband, if I pray for my wife, if I pray for my sister-in-law, if I I pray for my boss, how is that going to change them? And my response is, it may not, but it will always change you. And discipleship is not about you changing them. Discipleship is about Jesus changing you, Mm. right? And so if you are willing to go to the throne of God and say, God, I submit this relationship to you. God, I lay this relationship down. God may not change that person's heart. God may not change your parents. God may not change your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend or your roommate, but God is going to change your heart and he's going to give you the capacity to be who he's called you to be in the context of that relationship. I'm next. All right, number three. I was waiting for you to jump in there. I'm sorry. But I must have just said it all really great, so thank you. All right, uh, number three. Carve out time to invest in the relationship and not just spend time together. Now. <laughs> oh, this is going to hurt people, I got to tell you. This is going to leave a mark. I'm going to drink my coffee. Um, Trish and I spend a lot of time together. We are together at work, we're together at home, we're together when we travel, we're together all the time. And what the pandemic has done is it's given us more time together, right? And so we just, we see each other coming and going, we're just always there. And sometimes that is a really good thing. And I have made the mistake at times of equating time in the same place with quality time together. And so... I'm going to say a few weeks ago, it might even be more recent than that, but I'm just going to give myself some grace and say a few weeks ago, um, Trish came to me and she said, hey, we need to have a conversation. And one of the things that we have, we have buzzwords in our relationship that kind of cue us into how another person is feeling. And one of the phrases that we use in our relationship is we're not on the same page. And when I say we, I typically mean she. One of the phrases that she uses in our relationship typically is, we're not on the same page. And so she comes to me, she says, hey, we need to have a conversation. I don't think we're on the same page about something. And so then I paused Sports Center and I said, were you saying something? Um, (laughs) And uh, I'm just joking. Uh, Actually, I think we were out for a walk, if I'm just being honest. And, um, And she said, we have spent a lot of time together but we're, you're, we're not investing in our relationship. Like, we're together all the time, but we're not intentional about that time. And she's like, when's the last time we've talked about something besides the church? When's the last time we've talked about something besides the kids? When's the last time that we've done something other than the business of marriage? And I said, well, restaurants were closed. <laughs> <laughs> we've door dashed. P.F. Chang's, that's romantic. I lit some candles. Oh, that was my birthday. Um, 
And it was just this wake-up call. Like, we can't expect relationships to improve just because we're occupying the same space. Mm-hmm. Right? And so if you're not intentionally investing in a friendship, that friendship is not going to grow. If you're not intentionally investing in your kids, your relationship with your kids is not going to grow. Mm-hmm. And my, I, some of the things I've done to, re, to invest in my kids is, hey, let's all play a video game. Or why don't you play a video game and I'll scroll on my phone. We're in the same room. We're not, I'm not investing in them. All right? And, and so if you, if you are identifying some relationships that you feel disconnected from, my encouragement to you is, be, is to do an inventory of that relationship and say, when is the last time I've prioritized this relationship? When is the last time I've put this relationship above other things? And that has been, <laughs> uh, I wrote a book about this, all right? I wrote a book um, about being intentional in your marriage. And it's been a challenge for me during the pandemic because my mind has been in other places. And so I, I would encourage you, if you feel disconnected in a relationship and you feel like um, the pandemic or the election or just the, the culture of our world has taken a toll on your most important relationships, how intentional have you been uh, in that relationship? Which goes to the next best practice for healthy relationships. And I have said these two words, uh, three words, um, since the beginning of the church. And there's seasons, it's like cyclical. When I say these words, I get an eye roll or I get a thank you so much. And it's um, season and capacity. Season and capacity. I feel like um, those three words can change the trajectory of your life. We live in a social media world where it is very easy to get on social media and see somebody in their season and see them have the capacity to do what they're doing and then feel guilty or feel shame that you can't reciprocate that same life. And I think what has happened in, in COVID where we feel stretched too thin, where we all are going through crisis together, is that it has changed our season and capacity. And sometimes these are good and natural things. Um, two of our staff members that have been with us since we launched the church, um, the first one, um, Holly, uh, she's had her, he had her second baby yesterday. He's so handsome. Um, and she knows that in this season that she does not have the capacity to, to do the job that she has done here. And she's done an amazing job as our children's director. And in her season, she's recognized she doesn't have the capacity. Um, Lori Lange Bartles, who has literally been our glue for the past four years of all admin things, found herself in a season where her boys are full-time at home. And in her mind, like many of us, we thought maybe this is a semester. We have no idea. And when we recognize our capacity in our season, there is freedom. There's freedom to be able to walk in confidently how God has wired you without apologizing. But here's the truth about season and capacity. It is not your parent's job. It's not your spouse's job. It's not your pastor's job to be able to communicate your heart. You and only you know that in this season that we're in, what you have the capacity to do. And so sometimes the best thing that you can do to have healthy relationships is to know when to quit and know when to start. And there are some things that we have had to quit that maybe we don't even want to quit in order to start something that's going to make us healthy. So I want to challenge you today sometime where you find yourself in your relationships, where do you feel you are maxed out in your season? Now, I'm looking at a friend of mine who has lots of children, right? So when I look at her and what her season of life with her kids and her capacity is going to look different from someone who maybe is empty nesters, but it does not change the value of each person's significance of how to be healthy in this time of crisis. So check your fruit. Where are you struggling? And then check Where is your capacity to be a healthy friend, uh, to have all healthy relationships, mother, father, spouse, whatever label you put on, have a heart check to say, okay, what do I need to do to be healthy? That's good. Um, 
the last point, we're going to do some Q&A here. Uh, before, we, before I give the last point, if you have a question, we have about four questions that were submitted yesterday. Uh, if you have a question, you can text your question to 317-943-8773. And they're going to put the questions up on the screen uh, in real time. So um, no really hard theological questions, please. All right, uh, last one, uh, number five, would be offer grace in the amount that you want to experience it, or the amount that you want to receive it. Offer grace to those in your life in the way that you want to receive it from them. And I think we judge ourselves by our intentions. We judge other people by their choices, mm. right? And, and so we have good intentions, and so that's how we judge us. And then we look at other people's choices, other people's behavior, and that's how we judge them. And we don't give grace in the way that we want to receive it. Um, this kind of came into my life with my oldest son this, this week, um, we very rarely get into conflict, uh, he and I. Uh, we're, we're not wired the same, but we just have a natural affinity that we can work out differences in real time before it really becomes um, a heated conversation or an argument or a disagreement. And um, we made the mistake, first of all, of disagreeing over text message. That was the first mistake, all right? So he texts me, I read the text wrong, I'm yelling into my phone. You ever done that talk to text? I'm yelling into my phone. And Jalen's in the back seat, my 12-year-old son, and he said, Dad, you're talking to your phone as if Micah's next to you. And uh, I'm like, just leave me alone. I'll do what I want. All right? And so I'm yelling, and I'm on my way to Rooted. All right? I'm on my way to Rooted. And, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm yelling in the phone. And then he yells back. I'm sure he yells back at me because some things were on all caps. All right, so that's how you know someone's angry with you. And so then I call him. I'm like, enough of this. I call him. And uh, so then we go back and forth a little bit. And I think that he's wrong. He thinks that I'm wrong. And, um, and I really hurt his feelings. And I just thought, how are his feelings hurt? He's wrong, right? So then I come into Rooted. And uh, we're sitting there. And the... I don't even know what the lesson was on. I mean, I know what the lesson was on, the week was on, but um, each week has a theme. And I don't know if you've ever been in church um, and you have felt the Holy Spirit tell you something that has nothing to do with what the sermon is that day. And uh, that's kind of where I was. And so one of the questions in Rooted to just start the night was, give your high and your low of the week. And my low had happened like seven minutes before I sat down in that room. And so I just shared it. And so as I went through the night, I just realized that um, I could be right or I could be reconciled. Mm. Right? I could demand to be right or I could have this relationship reconciled. So one of Micah's favorite things when he was growing up was an Eminem blast from Sonic. And uh, we lived in Tennessee uh, during that season. And we don't really, there's, I mean, there's, like, there's one Sonic here in Indy. Um, but there wasn't one on the way to his house. So I went by Dairy Queen. I got him an Eminem blizzard. And I went over to his house and... Uh, I didn't realize I was going to get emotional. He wasn't home. He was at life group, which is funny. He was probably like going off on me to his life group. Uh, and so <laughs> I just thought about that. He was at his uh, life group that night. With, he's on staff at, at Northview. And uh, so every person there probably hates me. But anyway, um, and so I just, I, wait. I said, hey, how close are you to your house? He's like, I'm about 10 minutes away. I said, oh, well, I'll wait. And so I just gave him the, you know, the peace offering. I just gave him a big hug. And I just said, our relationship is way more important than what we're arguing about. And I, I need you to forgive me. And, you know, and then he asked for my forgiveness. And, but it was just, it was just this real-time uh, realization that I wanted to be right more than I really wanted, more than I cared about his feelings. And I wanted to make my point. And, and most of the time, you can make a point or you can make a difference, but you can't usually do both, right? And, and so if you're in a relationship that is broken, are you extending that person grace to the level that you want to get it from God? And um, it doesn't justify people's behavior. It doesn't justify their choices, but it builds a bridge to reconciliation. It creates an opportunity for a conversation, and it allows you to right-size your place in your relationship with God first, and then your relationship with that person. So let's do a little Q&A. 
Um, we got about five minutes to do about ten minutes of Q&A. So, Trish, um, why don't you take this one? <laughs> I haven't even read it. I have read it. Okay. Um, I want to make sure. What do you do when you're in a toxic dating relationship right and the other person is very negative, selfish, and not supportive? Your ongoing flip side, do everything for them with no appreciation shown or given in return. I'm sure there's a Beyonce song that would be a good response to that question, <laughs> but um, we, we have said this for years in student ministry. We've said this to our now adult kids with two of them married is dating is always about leaving the person better. And so you can, any relationship, regardless if it is a dating relationship or it's a friendship, we always, every day, have an opportunity to bring the best out of each other or bring the worst out. And if someone is constantly bringing the worst out of you, for you to use that word toxic, that's when you have to start making those really hard decisions of, of what is wise, what is the difference of um, enabling. And what I would encourage you to do is to find a, a few trusted people in your life in different spheres. If you have a, a friend who is like, oh, you need to let him go. Or if you have um, a parent who just thinks everything you do is wrong, that's probably not the healthy person to go to. But listen to the, the theme. If you have um, multiple people, I just had a conversation um, with a couple that comes to Hope City who has an adult kid who is really struggling. And they're in a season where their relationship has become so toxic, they've had to put up very firm boundaries. And so I would say, pre-decide what those boundaries are. And if the relationship continues to be toxic, the hardest choice you may have to make in this season, especially if it's a dating relationship, is to end that relationship. And you can end it in a way that leaves that person better, but you can either pull somebody up or you can have them pull you down. And there's, there's no five happy hops to make it easy. That's a really difficult decision. But when you ask yourself, where do I want to be uh, six months from now? Where do I want to be a year from now? Is that the toxic relationship you want to be tethered to? That's perfect. That's exactly what I was going to say. Did Estab you say that was perfect? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was going to say establish boundaries. If those boundaries are violated, then move on. And my guess is why you haven't moved on uh, already is because of fear. You're mm -hmm. scared that you're going to be alone or that no one else is going to love you. But loving someone and, or be, receiving love in a toxic way is not God's best for you. And let's just be honest. Like right now, going into the holiday season is... Um, for us as pastors, when we have the most intense, heartbreaking conversations because um, it's just hard. Like, the holidays are hard because it's this reminder of unhealthy relationships. Yep. Um, so just that encouragement that, one, you're not alone. And that I think sometimes when we say these antidotical, like, just do this, takes away like your feelings and that doesn't mean it will make you feel better in the immediate but in the long term it will always pay off that's good um next question last question maybe okay this is this is this is good um i've struggled letting go of a friendship that i've had since i was 18 our friendship fell apart when i went through my divorce 15 years ago she cut me out okay i can't read that my, my old eyes, uh, continually told me how disappointed she was with me and was constantly making me feel guilty because she was a part of every thought, therapy session, conversation with my then husband. I've tried to repair my relationship with her for 15 years. Uh, she made it clear that she wants nothing to do with me, but I've had so much trouble letting her go. She was a sister to me, and as a pleaser, I still find myself trying to find whatever wrong she feels I inflicted on her, right every wrong she feels I inflicted on her. How do I let go once and for all? My, I mean, obviously, if you, you've gone to therapy, I'm, I'm probably not as qualified as a therapist to, to address this. But as I read this question, um, what I gathered from this question was a lot of shame and a lot of guilt that you're living in, neither of which God designs for you. 
right? And the Bible says to do our best to live at peace with all people. And it sounds to me like you have done your best to be at peace with her. You've done your best to reach out to her. And the hole that she has left in your heart, um, you are blaming yourself for that. And so my encouragement, my anecdotal encouragement in 30 seconds that we have to answer this is God has forgiven you for whatever wrong you brought into that relationship, and it's time you forgive yourself, right? She obviously doesn't have the capacity to forgive you, and forgiveness and reconciliation don't always live together, right? Like maybe she has forgiven you. This relationship is just not meant to be reconciled right now. Um, But I, I think that it's important for you to accept the grace of God in this relationship and just say, okay, I've done my best. I've given everything I can. And so, God, I need you to repair the part of my heart that's still wounded from this person. And you may have to do that over and over and over again. Um, You know, Jesus talks about forgiving 70 times 7, and I think sometimes we have to apply that to ourselves. Not because we need forgiven that many times, but because sometimes it takes that many times for us to actually feel forgiven. And so maybe you just need to um, allow God and the grace of God to wash over you 70 times 7 to know that um, you're not responsible for her choices or her behavior and you have done everything you can to be faithful to her and faithful to the Lord uh, in this process. So, it's good stuff. If you texted a question, sorry. Um, I will answer it. We'll answer it next. Watch the next service online. We'll try to answer it next service. Um, I'm going to invite the, the worship team to come back up. We're going to close out with a song. And as they do that, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we just um, we recognize that there are so many complicating factors to our relationships these days. And the, the world that we live in, it feels like it's constantly trying to pull apart our most significant relationships. Our relationship with you, our relationship with the people that we love, our, our, at work. We're disconnected at work like never before. I mean, we, are, we work at the same place, but now we're in all kinds of different venues and over Zoom and not in person. And we question someone's intentions over email or over a text message. And I just love the scripture that Trisha said that there are a, there's a constant battle between the fruits of the Spirit and the fruits of this world. So help us to recognize that in our most significant relationships. Now give us grace for ourselves and grace for others. Help us to believe the best. Give us the humility to pray for our most difficult relationship. And know that you're more passionate about our relationships than we are. And you're fighting for us. So we give that to you in Jesus' name. Amen.